virtual network devices. So the first virtual network device we're going to talk about is a virtual server. Essentially a virtual server is instead of us having several physical servers, we can use virtualization technology to have multiple virtual instances of servers existing on a single powerful server. Uh, so in this case, in this picture here, we have one physical server piece of hardware, but we're running three different servers on it. We're running a Sun Solaris DNS server, we're running a Linux web server, and we're running a Microsoft Active Directory server, all in one piece of hardware. This single server is allowing us to do three things at once. Some of these servers can actually have hundreds of things at once, depending on the hardware requirements of that server. The good thing about this is it saves us a lot of money from an IT budget because we can consolidate numerous physical servers into a, into a single virtual instance. Uh, this also, we can actually add multiple NIC cards to give us more bandwidth. In this particular picture, we have a single NIC card, which may be a gigabit Ethernet. And so if you have three servers all sharing one gigabit, that can cause problems. So you might want to put two or three or four NIC cards and put them in teaming so you can have additional bandwidth. Uh, the idea of virtualization really is to get the hardware reduction. Uh, where I work, we had eight different servers. We virtualized those down to two hard pieces of hardware and four virtual servers on each one. And that provided us service for up to 3,000 users. So virtualization can really save you a considerable amount considering that each physical piece of hardware was about $2,000 for a server. Now I only need two of them, which gave me a $40,000 budget. Before I had eight of them, which was a $160,000 budget, 25% of my budget is what I'm using now, I save 75%. Virtualization can save you a considerable amount of money, especially if you're not going to be using a whole lot of hardware intensive uh, services. Virtual routers, firewalls, and switches. So because we have all these virtual servers, we need to have a way to connect to them uh, inside this virtual environment. And we can't physically put a switch in them because we're physically dealing with a computer, right? Uh, and so what we end up having is we have lots of different vendors who offer virtualized routers and switches and firewalls that provide the same physical features of those physical devices inside the virtual environment. So as you can see here, I have the same three machines that I, was, that I virtualized before. I have a DNS server, a web server, and an Active Directory server, and I have a virtual switch here, and each of those is being placed on its own VLAN, VLAN 10, 20, and 30, using a virtualized switch that's acting as a multi-layer switch. This virtual switch uh, overcomes the problem of having all these virtual servers being on the same broadcast domain because I'm using a layer 3 virtual switch here. Uh, layer 2 gives us control of VLANs and trunking. Layer 3 will give us the ability to do some routing in between these as well. And we can do quality of service and security through this additionally as well. Uh, remember though, once you have all of these things tied together, you still have to get to the physical world somehow. And that's where that single NIC right now and that trunk on that Ethernet switch is showing up. That is our physical connection outside of this physical piece of hardware with these three virtual systems inside of it. One of the new emerging technologies we have is what's called VDI, or Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, Virtual Desktops. And what this allows us to do is it has the storage of the entire operating system, applications, and data on a server. This data then can be accessed by a user on any device they want, it could be on their cell phone, their tablet, their laptop, or their computer, because it's agnostic to it. All of this is being run back on the server, usually in a web browser or some other client, and these environments become nothing more than a standard thin client, and we get rid of this old thick client technology. The cost is still fairly expensive on this, but it is coming down. The big benefit in these is a security aspect, because you can control everything from the server farm and push the updates and roll them back, just like you could with a virtual machine. Uh, they're, they're a very cool technology that's coming out. Microsoft is becoming a really big player in this, as well as uh, VMware with their Horizon suite of products. Next thing we're going to talk about is network as a service. So one of the things that people are starting to do now is they're actually contracting out their infrastructure and having network and server uh, being pushed out to a service provider instead of themselves. All of this stuff is virtualized and hosted off-site, kind of in the cloud, as we say, um, at the data center. And the customers then build based on usage. Almost like you'd get a power bill, you'd also get a network bill. Okay? And this would provide you your virtual, virtualized router and your virtualized uh, computers all being held in this network as a service, as you see on the left. You're charged either by hours used or processing power used or bandwidth used depending on your contract model. And it's kind of, if you think about the old telephone provider used to get that bill for how much, many minutes you got, it's the same kind of concept here. 
but you're contracting out your network services, so you don't have to worry about it. This works really well for small size businesses especially because they can't afford to have specialized network technicians on staff all the time, and so contracting out your network this way can be a cost savings uh, for those type of companies. Software as a service is where the user interacts with web-based applications instead of physical applications on their device. And the details of how everything is works is hidden from your users. Some good examples of this is Google Docs and Office 365 if you use those products. Instead of having to have Office installed on your machine locally, you just pay an annual fee and you use theirs through a web-based interface. Uh, and it gives you Microsoft Office, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, all of those in the cloud. And they're constantly updated, constantly secured by Microsoft and all your documents can be stored in the cloud as well. Another good example of this is if you use a Google Chromebook and you use Google Docs. They have all of those same type of functions. Everything is done in the cloud, not on the local machine. We also have what's called platform as a service, and this is usually used uh, more for development. So this gives you a development platform that companies who are developing applications can do so without the need for having the infrastructure required to do that. And some examples of this are things like Pivotal, OpenShift, and Apprenda. Um, most of us aren't going to use platform as a service very often unless you're working for a software development company. Uh, that's where you start pushing all of the stuff into the cloud for that. And then we have the overall cloud computing. So everybody hears about the cloud nowadays. Uh, we have lots of different clouds though. We have public clouds, private clouds, and hybrid clouds available. A private cloud is a system where you, only the system and users have access to devices in the same private cloud or system. So it may be, for instance, you're working for a government agency that has put stuff into the cloud, but only that government agency has access to that cloud. That would be a private cloud. A public cloud, on the other hand, is where users and systems interact with other devices on public networks, such as the internet or other clouds. So if you want to think of something like, I don't know, YouTube, that's a cloud service that we all can share our videos on. And I can put them up and you can put them up. A hybrid, on the other hand, is a combination of a public and a private cloud. And uh, probably the best example I can think of of this is probably Google. Uh, they have the ability to give you a hybrid cloud for your business. For instance, if you buy a domain name, you can have them provide your web hosting as well as give you software applications and email and all of those type of things in the cloud for you and for your business. And so it's a public cloud service that's being privately held for you, so it becomes more of a hybrid. With private, really the big distinction is you own all the systems, all the hardware, and all the stuff. So the, the government has a lot of private clouds they own. Uh, some big colleges have private clouds spread across multiple campuses and things of that nature. And the other thing we're going to talk about here is voice over internet protocol. And the reason why this is in virtualized devices is because essentially it's virtualized phones. Uh, we have taken the old digital analog, the old analog phones and digitized that and now we use them as a software service. You can actually have a voice over IP phone application on your computer or you can have an actual physical handset like we do here in this classroom. Uh, what it, voice over IP does is it digitizes your voice so that it can be treated like other data on the network, going back to that converged networks we were talking about earlier. It uses session in initiation protocol to set up, maintain, and tear down those calls. So that SIP is operating at the session layer, layer 5. Voice over IP can save you a lot of money, and it can provide you a lot of enhanced services over a traditional public branch exchange system, uh, because you can have things like voicemail and three-way calling and caller ID and all that stuff added on uh, at pretty much no cost when you're using voice over IP. As you notice here in the diagram, you have the IP phone, which can be either a software or a hardware handset connected to a switch. And again, with voice over IP phones, we can use power over Ethernet to provide the power to those. Uh, you'll have a call agent or a call manager, which will get those phone calls and then place them by making it into IP traffic that goes over the gateway and across the wide area network. Once it gets to a PBX, which is the public branch exchange, it will then go transferred into the analog phone call. So for instance, if I'm calling from this office here and I'm calling my wife's cell phone, I will use an IP phone, but I will be connecting to her, her cell phone which is an analog phone. And that is virtualized network devices.